Everybody has their favorite topic, I guess. Uh, maybe not. Maybe some of you just love it all. I, I love it all, but I, I, this is certainly um, one of my favorite lectures. I, I love talking about it. I'm constantly humbled and awed by the structures that we're about to talk about. Um, <clears throat> Behold such a sight. Angels sing in their design, eye and ear sublime. Truly. Uh, okay, a little bit of the history, I'm sorry. I, I find this to be uh, fascinating. I particularly like opportunities to undermine the Eurocentric narrative of modern medicine. This gentleman here, uh, Sushruta Samhita, uh, lived almost 3,000 years ago, almost 3,000 years ago, in India, in the city, the holy city of Kashi. He was an Ayurvedic uh, scholar, uh, physician, thinker, philosopher, uh, and healer. He had... Um, developed, particularly I'm talking about him now because his specialty was the eye. He was particularly fascinated with the eye, both metaphorically and quite literally physically. Um, he had texts that he wrote which described 76 unique ocular diseases. That's pretty remarkable. 76 unique ocular diseases uh, identified 3,000 years ago. He had surgical techniques uh, for treating many of these and is described as being the first cataract surgeon. That's incredible. 3,000 years ago, this man uh, living in the Indian subcontinent was performing cataract surgery, removing uh, clouded, the clouded film over uh, the, the lens. So uh, we see a picture here on the left of some of the implements that uh, he devised and had crafted for the treatment of these ocular diseases. So, um, yeah, of the 76, 51 of them were uh, able to be treated surgically. So pretty, pretty remarkable for when this occurred. Uh, in, in, the, in the timeline. Uh, unfortunately, it took a very long time for all of this knowledge uh, to make its way west. Uh, in terms of the European story, it took them about 2,000 years later uh, for this guy, John Freak, to hit the scene. Um, he is credited with ushering in the modern age of ophthalmology and established uh, a very famous eye hospital in England, uh, Moorfields, Moorfields in, in London. Uh, this was where uh, the Europeans were able to make the same advances that Shushruta uh, was doing in the 8th century BC. All right, so um, let's see how well the anatomy is sunk in. We're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go around and test you guys. Where should we start? You're all gonna get a chance, all gonna get a chance. So um, Ella, why don't you tell me, let's hear first, we'll make it easy for you. What is this structure? The lens, very easy, no need to be afraid. Uh, Colette, why don't you also give us uh, the easy answer to what this structure is referring to here. What is that? The iris. The iris, okay. Uh, Andrea, Andy, why don't you uh, get a little bit more difficult? Tell me specifically only what this blue area is called. Okay, good job, good job. Um, 
Katie, why don't you tell me what this part of the eye is right here? Um, is that retina? Close. It rhymes with retina, but it's a little bit cornier than the retina. The cornea? The cornea, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Livia, you're a smart cookie. We're going to give you a hard one here. How about this? Uh, scallop structure down here. What do we call that one? Uh, the orosarata. The orosarata. Very good. Um, Charlie, uh, what is this white tunic called around the outside? The sclera. The sclera. All right. Who's next? Yeah, you. Uh, Amy, why don't you tell us what this orange structure is here? The one laying uh, just deep to the sclera. Is it, oh, I, the, the, the choroid, the choroid, yep, yeah, that is definitely choroid, uh, plexus. Um, Mara, what's another name for that entire layer? That's a hard one, but you can do it. You got it, Nubia, nice job. All right, June, uh, you want a hard one or an easy one? <laughs> you want an easy one, okay. So what's the next layer here? The back side of it is painted in yellow, but then all this stuff here is in orange. Yeah. That's the retina. Okay. Um, Sarah. So what, let me think here. What about this structure right here, this whole area? What we, do we call that whole area? Do you remember that? It's pretty tricky. Mm, no, close. No, it's, it's, it's a little bit sillier than that. Do you want to help help her out, Daisy? Like the, the ciliary body, that's right. Um, so we're not going to give up on, on Sarah, though. We'll give you an easy one. How, what is this structure back here? The octet. The What's it? Octet. The optic nerve. Yeah, it's all right. I put you on the spot. Yeah, optic nerve. Um, all right, Kevin. So, uh, what is this structure right here? Good work. Nice job. All right. I'm going to give you a hard one. There may not be too many hard ones left. Oh, okay. Yeah, here's a great hard one. See that little dot right there? <laughs> And it's over here <laughs> as well. <laughs> what, what, is, what is that? Remember? I gave it three it's, different names. It's a cavern. Yeah, it's. Does anyone remember? It's a hard one. What do you say, Lizzie? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the canal of Schlem. Remember that one? What, what else did we call that? Anyone remember? The scleral venous sinus. Yep. Yeah, Gray's Anatomy called it. What do they call it? The. Uh, sulcus, uh, what did they call it? Sulcus uh, something corneae. Sulcus, I don't know, doesn't matter. Canal of Schlamm will work. Uh, who's next, Sydney? Um, okay, what is this little divot down here called? Fovea, very good. Uh, Saketsi. I'm running out of stuff here. Um, okay, this is this is going to challenge you to look, think hard. Uh, what is this muscle called? It's hard. It's not that hard, but it's going to face a little bit of critical thinking. What is that muscle called? Anyone else? Want to hop in, Sandra? Want to help them? Say it. It's a rectus, yeah, which one? Okay, so we have lateral and medial. How many people say it's lateral? How many people say it's medial? Couple. All right, defend, let's go with medial. Defend yourself, why is it the medial? So you're, you're telling me if it's the medial, that your nose is right here, right? If you're saying it's the medial, then the nose is right here. 
What do you think, Bella? Uh, why'd you say? Goes towards the nose. So you're saying this is not medial. You're saying it's. I'm saying that's lateral. Lateral. Is there anyone else saying medial? No. Okay, so it's lateral. It is lateral. Yeah. Um, I think I've run out of students and anatomy. Okay, let's go. Oh, there's one more, but we'll get it later. Does anyone else want to do one? What are these things that hold the lens up called? These little things there. Anybody? Mm, not close. There are ligaments. <laughs> the suspensory ligaments. Good. Good. All right. There's the anatomy. Hopefully that helped. A little help from our friends. All right. So what did I do here? We're not going to go through all the anatomy. The anatomy should be in your, in your brains now. Um, <clears throat> what does the sclera do? Well, it... it functions to support the eye. Uh, it protects the eye from uh, injury. It does more than that, however. The sclera uh, provides sort of a springy force that uh, we're going to talk about when we talk about accommodation or the ability of the eye to focus, uh, uh, change its focal length. So this, the sclera is the fibrous layer that uh, in, connection, in conjunction with the, uh, the cornea provides this protective uh, framework that um, is going to have some tensile strength that uh, the ciliary muscles are going to work against uh, the ciliary muscles right up here. So I'll just, I can just say it, uh, I can preview it now by saying that the ciliary muscles, which are a ring, that goes there is beneath the iris that goes underneath around the, the lens. It's going to contract. It's going to this these muscles are going to contract, and instead of pulling on the lens, what they're doing is going to is going to make that ring of muscle a little bit smaller and work against the tensile strength of the sclera. All right, and it's going to re, when these muscles contract, it's actually going to relieve tension on the lens. It's being placed by the tensile uh, strength of the sclera. That makes sense. We'll hit it again in a bit. Yeah, it, it, it just, just slightly, just very, very slightly. Uh, and, and relieves tension on the uh, lens. This, that drawing is, is just a cartoon. It's not a very good depiction of the actual mechanics there. Uh, the retina is responsible for photoreception. And, and then the uvea, this is sort of like, uh, the uvea is like the supply lines for the eye. This is where we're getting uh, blood and lymphatics, um, where we're, you know, trying, with all that the blood does, nutrients, uh, waste, oxygen, etc. And um, it's also, at, by virtue of the fact that the iris is part of the uvea, it's going to regulate the amount of light, the intensity of light that is reaching uh, the eye. Um, it also uh, is by virtue of it having both the scleral venous sinus, canal of Schlem, and the choroid, it's going to secrete and resorb the aqueous humor. And finally, uh, the ciliary body is part of the uvea and is going to control the shape of the lens. All right. So first, the pupillary muscles, not to be confused with the, the ciliary muscle. The pupillary muscles, there's two of them. There's a pupillary dilator and a pupillary constrictor. The pupillary dilators are uh, these muscles whose fibers radiate out away from the uh, central axis of the eye. And when they contract, they pull, they dilate the pupil. They pull uh, the opening wider. Whereas when we have a pupillary constrictor, these are sphincter muscles that when they contract, they make the hole smaller. Okay? And... When they're you know, in a low light situation, 
your eye dilates right here. Now, this photo is a little bit misleading because we see all these bright lights from the photo uh, studio reflecting in this eye. This person must have had a, uh, a, a, uh, a dilating drug uh, put in their eye to make their eye do that. Uh, but normally, in a dark room, that eye would be uh, wide open. And in a bright room, it would get small like this. The intraocular pressure is, is really important uh, physiologically and pathologically. Um, it, it's the pressure, it's the fluid pressure of the aqueous humor in the eye. This helps the eye maintain the appropriate shape. Um, and the reason this is important for in, in terms of pathology, it's people with glaucoma are people who are not able to regulate their intraocular pressure very well. Uh, maybe some of you have a, a grandparent or a, or a parent or somebody with uh, glaucoma. This is elevated intraocular pressure. It becomes a problem because just like uh, in congestive heart failure, when you have all this fluid in the pericardial cavity, and, and the, uh, our, the coronary arteries are not able to push blood through those arteries against the fluid pressure in the uh, pericardial cavity. The same thing happens here. When you have an elevated fluid intraocular fluid pressure, the ophthalmic arteries, uh, which are supplying blood to the retina, are not able to push blood against that fluid pressure uh, very well, and it starves the retina of... Uh, the blood that it needs, and eventually the retina dies. So uh, maintaining the appropriate intraocular fluid pressure is important. If you have too low of an intraocular fluid pressure, uh, it's not. you can have something called retinal detachment, where the retina pulls away from the uvea and also dies. So ha maintaining the sweet spot uh, of intraocular pressure is very important for maintaining uh, site. I talked about how it cycles in lab already, but it's made uh, by the choroid and the ciliary body, comes out through the posterior chamber of the anterior cavity, and then passes through the pupil and is resorbed into the scleral venous sinus. Guy Schlem was so excited to get his name on something. All right, here's a picture of the vitreous body. Um, it helps stabilize the eye, supports uh, the retina. This is a, a weird picture because they like cut the, the vitreous just out of it. I, it's probably a cow uh, that they've taken, or maybe a human. Who knows what that is? Uh, but this uh, vitreous body is mostly water. 99% of it is water, uh, but there are various uh, salts, sugars, and uh, this protein called vitrocine, uh, which in a type two, there's also a type two collagen, uh, vitrocine, and then hyaluronic acid. Um, the the vitrocine is this protein with unusual optical properties, which helps to uh, allow light to pass through the uh, matrix of the vitreous body. Hyaluronic acid, which is what's depicted here, it's this. Uh, Carbohydrate, this acidic carbohydrate, that's an acidic group right there. That's a, that's a carboxylic acid group. Uh, this um, sugar moiety does not like to be dehydrated. So there's all these OH groups on there, and it's very difficult to dehydrate that. Uh, and consequently, uh, the vitreous body is, maintains its, its hydration is sort of buffered. Uh, by the presence of the hyaluron. All right, the lens. Uh, these, the lens is made up of uh, these fiber cells that as they move from the periphery, here are the suspensory ligaments in this electron micrograph uh, attached to the ciliary body uh, right here. Uh, the the fibrocytes, uh, as they mature, 
their nucleus degrades. They resorb the nucleus. So that in the center of the lens, these cells, which merge with one another, they merge, they are anuclear. They are non-dividing. They, they have no genetic material in them. They are not able to produce any proteins. They are, they're quiescent cells. Uh, they do this for what reason, would, might you guess? Yeah, to, to increase translucence, to increase the, the optical penetrance uh, of the light. So the cells, uh, and the, the early, in the early stages, they're just pumping the cells full of this uh, protein called crystalline. It is, an, a, again, um, much like vitrocin, just a, a protein that's going to change the optical properties of the lens. So uh, sometimes with UV exposure, say you spend a lot of time outside without uh, sunglasses on, and uh, by the time you get old, these uh, crystalline proteins get cross-linked by the UV, so UV cross-linked, uh, and they lose their optical properties and become uh, clouded, occluded by the cataract, by the so-called cataract, all right? So what you see here, this guy's eye is red because what you're seeing is the retina on the back, but on this eye, for some reason, he's got a cataract. And what does he see through there? He sees a milky, milky blur. He's not able to see through that eye very well. Uh, so he needs to have cataract surgery. He probably already had it on this side, is my guess. All right. Uh, I don't know what the point was here. Oh, yeah, so... Uh, light comes in through the eye, passes through the cornea. The cornea does have some uh, non-negligible refractive index, meaning that it does help to focus the eye. And in fact, when you get uh, radiokeratotomy or uh, LASIK or those, all those different techniques, they, uh, all those techniques seek to inscribe onto the cornea. They, they etch into the cornea and change the optical properties of the cornea to make up for any aberration in the lens that you may have. Um, so this is an alternative to, uh, cater to uh, contact lenses or, or corrective lenses of any sort. Uh, light passes through the cornea, goes through the iris, and then passes through the lens where the light is focused uh, down onto the back of the retina, uh, particularly onto the uh, fovea, which is at the center of the visual axis. Right, so the word refraction, uh, hopefully you've all remember it from high school physics class. It's simply the bending of light by going from one media uh, that has one optical, uh, optical uh, refractive index into a different media with a different optical refractive index. It's like uh, looking into a pool, you're outside the pool, you see the uh, toy that you dropped in the bottom of the pool, you're going to dive down to get it, but uh, it's not actually where you see it in the bottom of the pool. Or if you stick the hook down into the pool, the, the pole appears to bend um, because the light has been bent. So uh, light coming in from a distant source is, is focused at some point, uh, and this focal distance uh, this focal distance is, whether you're looking at a close source or a distant source, is dependent upon the curvature of the lens, the, the shape of that lens, all right? And changing the shape of that lens is called accommodation. We'll talk about that in another slide or two here. Uh, one, of the, one of the things about, uh, the, about the refraction of light and the optics of the eye is there's this notion of inversion. So when you have light that comes in, light that's at the top of your visual field, like the light up here on the ceiling or whatever, comes in, passes through the lens, and is cast to the bottom uh, backside of the eye. Whereas stuff from a, a low visual field, there's supposed to be squares down here, uh, it's cast to the top of the back of the eye. 
So uh, because of that, images are inverted. The image that's cast onto the back of the eye is actually upside down, and the same is true side to side. It's upside down and backwards. All right. Well, why doesn't the world look upside down and backwards to us? Sometimes it may feel that way, but it doesn't really appear literally to be upside down and backwards, does it? That, again, is just the label line code. Right? The, your brain interprets the signals uh, and maps them out in a way that's coherent um, and coherently interpreted. Okay, accommodation. The shape of the lens changes uh, to the focus on the retina. So when you're looking at something close, you need to have a fat or rounded, uh, uh, rounded lens. To make this happen, the ciliary muscles contract. When the ciliary muscles contract, uh, it is releasing tension. It's releasing tension on these, on these uh, ligaments that's being put there by the sclera wanting to open up a little bit. So you contract, you squeeze this ring down a little bit, release tension, and allow the lens to, to become round, which is what it, its resting shape would be. And then uh, when the ciliary muscles relax, it releases the inherent tensile tension in the sclera, and these ligaments yank on the lens and stretch the lens out. Does that make sense, how that works? I said it was going to perhaps be counterintuitive. The lens is, when the muscles contract, they're not pulling on the lens, they're releasing tension on the lens is what they're doing. Okay? Uh, is there anyone in the classroom that's astigmatic? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> astigmatic is an abnormality in the shape of the cornea. The cornea is not perfectly... Uh, spherical. It's not a perfect dome. And so what happens is people who are astigmatic in whichever eye that is, the, the image gets a little bit distorted. It's a little bit like looking in a funhouse mirror. All right? And then it can give them real headaches because their brain is trying to integrate these, you know, the information from the one eye and the other eye and it's not like it's not a linear mapping between uh, the retinas of either eye, and it, it can give them a headache uh, trying to deal with it. So an astigmatic, uh, one, anybody who in the class who's astigmatic, if they were to take off their glasses, whatever their corrective lenses are, and look at this, each of these numbers is uh, evenly distributed about the, um, about the dial here, but if you were astigmatic and you looked at that, uh, and you may have to be closer. It may not work exactly very well in here. But uh, with one eye, if you looked at it with the astigmatic eye, maybe one and two would appear to be much closer, and seven and six would be much further away, uh, et cetera. You can actually map out uh, the radial astigmatism in an eye just with a simple chart like this. Nowadays, they have these like super fancy laser things that scan your eye and, and tell you what the astigmatic uh, thing is, but old school was using those charts. Okay, so here are just definitions. Here's just some terms. So uh, there is, across, uh, related to the concept of visual acuity, and a visual acuity is how uh, clear your vision is, how sharp your vision is, okay? So um, first, uh, this is this is for Emma. Emotropia. That's normal vision. 2020 vision is called emotropia. Emotropia. So then um, we have myopia and hyperopia. So myopia is uh, nearsightedness. Nearsightedness, meaning you're able to see things uh, close, but you're not able to see things very far away. And the way to deal with it, so in a normal myopic person, the, uh, the image is cast forward of the, of the retina, all right? And um, it's, it's 
basically due to uh, a, a poor match between the lens and the shape of the eyeball. Okay? Uh, you deal with it by having a diverging lens is, is how you uh, adjust for myopia. Then there is hyperopia, which is far-sightedness, not able to see things close up, not able to see things close up, and that needs a converging lens. Um, and these are the sort of uh, Coke bottle glasses that you have seen your grandma wear, maybe. They uh, cannot see things very far away. They have these giant lenses on them that when you look at your grandma's eyes, her eyes look like two giant tennis balls. Uh, the, uh, this is due to not just hyperopia, but hyperopia in the elderly is called presbyopia. So that, those grandma glasses, it, it is a form of hyperopia that we call presbyopia. And uh, is there anybody, I was, so I was raised Catholic, and I don't know exactly, is it Anglicans? Where, oh, probably Presbyterians. Uh, are there any Presbyterians in the, in the audience? No? Well, the, a presbyter, it, who, who, what is a presbyter? Does anybody know what that word means? In the church, it is a church elder, a church elder. So presbyter means elder, and presbyopia is the vision of uh, the elderly. Okay? It's a, it's a type of hyperopia. Um, so normal emetropic vision is 2020, meaning that uh, we say that normal vision, what a, a person with normal vision can see at 20 uh, feet, if you can see that at 20 feet, then your vision is 2020. If, if, if um, 2040 vision uh, is you can see at 20 feet what a person with normal vision can see at 40 feet. A person, if you can see what a normal person can see at 200 feet and you can see at 20 feet is 2200. Uh, that, I think, is the boundary for legal blindness. Um, you have to be pretty poor vision to see that. Okay, so then we talked about the fovea and the optic disc. Fovea is where uh, your, the visual axis is. That's center of focus. The optic disc is your blind spot. All right, this is where the optic nerve enters the back of the eye. There actually are no photoreceptors there. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of anatomy can be uh, identified uh, by looking at the optic disc. So the first thing I'll say is uh, when you see, when you go to see a good neuro-ophthalmologist, not just an ophthalmologist, but a neuro-ophthalmologist who is an ophthalmologist who is, uh, who is looking at the optic nerve, that's their specialty, um, when they come into the room, the old school ones uh, are going to have a little red quilting pin tucked in their lapel like that. And that's because with that little red quilting pin, you can actually map the person's visual field quite accurately, just right there without having a machine in, in front of you. Um, you can do the little experiment with yourself. You can take uh, maybe a pencil with an orange eraser on the back where you can get yourself one of these pins. Fix your eye, close one eye, fix your eye on a point, and then you can take that pin and you can move it around until just a little bit to the, to the lateral of your visual axis until the tip of that pin is going to have to be a unique color to stand out, like this pencil here would work, uh, until the eraser on it disappears, and you can't see it any longer. You can find the blind spot. There, there's my uh, kind of a fun little experiment. How did, you don't see a black spot in your visual field there, do you? Your brain just sort of mushes things in the area together. Uh, and sort of just says, well, whatever's around there, we're just kind of kind of average it together, because you're not usually looking right at that little dot. If you have a problem with your optic nerve, uh, that blind spot can get quite big. 
and becomes what's called a scotoma. A scotoma, and there, I'm probably jumping the gun, it may be on another slide here, but a scotoma is a, a deficit in your visual field. It's a deficit in your visual field. So there, everybody's got a small scotoma of the, over their blind spot, but they can get bigger uh, if you have some kind of pathology. So, uh, okay, yeah, here's a demonstration of the presence of a blind spot. Maybe this will work. So close one eye, uh, focus your eyes on the X, and the, the open eye on the X, and if you are at the right orientation, maybe you can get it so that the black dot disappears. So, yeah, for you, it, you would be wanting to turn away because the, the blind spot is on the lateral side. So... May, may not work. You, it, it helps if you're... So I'm looking at it on my computer screen now, and the, the dot is completely gone. Did it work for anybody? No? Okay. So what is unique about the optic nerve is it is the only nerve in the body, the only nerve in the body that can be visualized Externally, I, you can see it. You can look at it. How do you do this? You get an ophthalmoscope. And you look inside the eye. How do you use an ophthalmoscope? If you ever go into a uh, consult suite and ha are going to have somebody look at your optic nerve and they do this, then treat everything they say with deep skepticism because this is not how you use this piece of equipment. You have to get right up on the person. You have to invade their personal space, but you're doing it for the greater good. Uh, you put the ophthalmoscope right next to their eye, and you look in there, and you can inspect the entire back of the retina. You can get a good look at the optic nerve, etc. This guy doesn't see anything in her eye, and, and she has no idea about it. She's just smiling at him. Okay, so why? Why are we going to do this? Well, here's the optic nerve. Here's the optic nerve, and we have this cupping. We can have cupping, or just, here, this is the way it's supposed to look. Your healthy optic nerve should look like this. Each of these uh, show different types of pathology. Here's glaucoma. Intraocular pressure is high. Compressing on uh, the optic nerve and preventing the appropriate blood flow, pressing the axons of the, uh, the ganglion cells that are passing through there, that's a problem. Uh, multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, uh, different kinds of infections. Uh, so here, this is a tumor. How do I know that this person has a, a brain tumor? Because of the cupping. The thing about it is, say you have a mass in the brain somewhere that's increasing intracranial pressure, that's going to press on the optic nerve. That optic nerve is going to press into the back of the eye and cause cupping on that optic disc. So if, you have, if you're a neuro-ophthalmologist that's really sharp and knows what you're looking at, you can tell a whole lot about a person just by recognizing the pathology in the optic disc. It's, it's a worthwhile uh, art to learn uh, what you're what you're seeing when you see the optic disc, All right? So now we have these modern visualization methods. Uh, this is me actually. I uh, I had my vitreous humor detached from the retina, not a detached retina, just the vitreous humor came away. And I got the those those floaters they're called, right? So I went and had some doctor do all this stuff to me. I'm fine, uh, but. They can show you, so here's the back of one retina, and here's the back of the other, and you can see the fovea uh, in there, and uh, I don't know what all, quite all this stuff means, but I'm not going to go through any of it with you, just to show you what a, a contemporary readout looks like nowadays. Okay, so rods and cones. Rods are... Uh, scotopic vision. They are highly sensitive. It only takes a single photon, one photon, one light particle, that's very little, to set off a, 
a rod. A single photon can set off a rod. Scotopic just means dark vision. Very sensitive. Cones, on the other hand, is where we get our color vision. They're focused in the fovea. You have a higher density of them in the, fo uh, in the fovea. Uh, this gives you highly resolved, highly resolved images. All right? uh, the, these rods are not high visual acuity. There's not a high density of them. It's not gonna, giving you a high, uh, a high resolution. It's just giving you a high sensitivity. You know that there's some light there, but it's hard to make out exactly what it is. So if you turn, if you go walking around at night in the moonlight, you're using mostly these, these rods. Uh, in the daytime, it's, it's the cones. And you have much higher visual clarity uh, in, the, in the daytime. All right. So let's, let's take a little look at how these, these cells work. Um, first of all, in a cone, we have well, the, the, the portions of a, of a photoreceptor. There's this outer segment, uh, which is where we have uh, the, the chromophores, the molecules that are going to actually absorb the light. Then there's this inner segment, which is like the cell body. It's got the nucleus and the mitochondria and all the other stuff that normal cells have. And then there uh, is the synapse on the end. Of the cell, right? So this is like an axon and a synapse. Okay. Well, in these cones, the, there are these stacks of membranes that are just uh, the, the outer membrane pushes in, and you form these stacks that form a cone that kind of inserts itself into uh, these into these uh, pigmented epithelial cells. Uh, the cones. Uh, I'm sorry, the rods are these discs. It's these stacks of lamellar discs uh, that are stacked up, like so. So look, in either case, though, if you look closely, uh, in these membrane stacks <clears throat> are embedded, is embedded this molecule called uh, uh, opsin. And opsin is bound to a chromophore called retinal. Retinal is, uh, a, is uh, a metabolite of vitamin A. It comes from vitamin A. Uh, you get like carrots and stuff like that. Beta carotene is two vitamin A attached to one another. So retinal is the chromophore that binds to opsin, and together the opsin with the retinal then becomes what we call rhodopsin. All right? So opsin and retinal becomes uh, rhodopsin. Let's see how it actually works. So the way photoreception works is very strange. It's very strange to me. Um, and I have never heard what I consider to be a truly convincing argument uh, for why it works this way. I've heard some hypotheses, some of them probably more substantiated than others. But I, I, I don't think that anybody, maybe I'm wrong at this point, but I don't think anybody could stand up here and give you a definitive uh, evolutionary explanation for why it, it works this way, but it does. So in the dark, in the dark when there is no light hitting a uh, photoreceptor, there are these sodium channels up here in the, in the outer segment uh, sodium channels that are uh, C-protein coupled receptors, these uh, uh, CGMP is bound, cyclic GMP is bound uh, to this, uh, this gated sodium channel, all right? And sodium is just coming in here. And as sodium comes in, uh, there's this dark current where the sodium comes in, travels down here, and then sodium gets pumped out by um, an ATPase down in the inner segment. When this is happening, this, ne this neuron, this photoreceptor, is releasing neurotransmitter. It's saying, 
It, it's stimulating. It's, it, there's an action potential. There's this repeated action potentials that are happening when there is no light around. This is called the, the dark current. The dark current. Sodium, there's this sodium current that's just normally pumping all the time when this uh, thing is not being hit by light. And we get neurotransmitter release down there. I didn't get to talk about uh, I didn't get to talk about uh, G-coupled receptors or any any of that kind of stuff. Uh, cyclic GMP in the other lecture, but maybe some of you have heard of it. This is just a regulatory molecule. Uh, guanosine monophosphate is one of the the nucleotides. Uh, that make up DNA, but then they can cyclize and form this cyclic chemical uh, that, it, uh, when present, binds uh, to this um, to this protein. So, step one: photoreception. A photon comes in, gets absorbed by uh, the retinal, eleven cis retinal. So, what is a cis bond? A cis bond. For those of you who haven't had uh, organic chemistry, you can have, uh, so there is this uh, ring and then a long chain of dehydration, right? This is a carbon chain that looks like this. And every other bond is a double bond that looks like that. So we can have, uh, let me see if I can do it. Yeah, that looks right, something like that. Uh, this would be 11 cis, 11 cis. I think, you know, whatever, there's stuff on either end. This, I'm just taking a little portion of it. This is a carbon chain, double bonds. This double bond does not rotate, can't rotate. Uh, this is a high energy configuration, though, because these two long chains are both on the same side of the double bond. They're on the same side of the double bond. Okay? This is trans. This is trans. If I were to look at the energy profile of this, so here's reaction coordinate, and here's energy, this would be uh, the 11, I'm sorry, 11 cis, and here would be 11 trans, okay? Uh, this is lower energy right here. But to get from here to here, there's a little energy bump. You need a little bit of activation energy to get over that hump, all right? That energy is uh, the photon. All right, that is the energy from the photon. So it's isom. Oh, geez, I have pictures of it. Right. So here we have the cis double bond, high energy structure, absorbs the uh, the photon, and then isomerizes to the trans configuration. Easy. Okay. Step one. When that happens, it causes a cascade of of things. Uh, so conformational shift here causes a shift in transducin, uh, which causes an activation of this uh, protein called phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase is a protein that's going to cleave the phosphodiester bond that is cyclizing the cyclic GMP. When that happens, this is going to start inactivating the cyclic GMP. There's not going to be that much cyclic GMP in... Uh, the membrane any longer. Cyclic GMP is going to diffuse off and the door is going to shut and sodium is not going to be able to pass into the cell any longer. When that happens, here comes the light, this is going to stop this dark current. Sodium is going to get pumped out without any sodium being able to come back in in this like, they're not really leak channels, it's kind of leak channel because it's open all the time in the dark, but when the light comes on, it shuts off and it polarizes, uh, it repolarizes this membrane. When the membrane gets polarized, the 
the release of neurotransmitter stops. Stops. When this happens, this bipolar cell says, <coughs> okay, there must have been light. Let there be light. Here's a picture of this so-called ribbon synapse. This synapse here that I talked to, I mentioned it in lab, how it's very sophisticated. They have mapped out all the different receptors and, and the regulatory mechanisms around this, this synapse. This is an, a, a profoundly complicated synapse. This is, that's like a simplified schematic of one as it is. Uh, so I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the man to, to tell you about that further. Josh Martin knows a little bit more than I do about it, but not a whole lot. It's a specialist thing. Um, so how do we reset the cycle? Photon comes in, uh, lights up the retinal, causing the isomerization to an 11 trans. Uh, we get bleaching, this bleaching event. Uh, 11 trans, when it, when it becomes 11 trans, it diffuses off the, uh, the rhodopsin, leaving opsin. Then we have to put energy back into the system. We have uh, this enzyme, some enzyme, uh, who is an uh, isomerase, uh, isomerase, retinal something isomerase. Uh, that uses ATP, the energy of ATP hydrolysis, to re-kink the retinal. Once this is here, this is happily willing to bind to opsin again to reform rhodopsin, and we, we close the cycle. Okay? This is called bleaching. We bleach the uh, 11 trans retinal off of there by, by light. Okay. So when I, I sit here and talk to you guys, and your backs are turned, but I get to stare at that blinding light there all the time, and I look away and I see these little spots in my vision uh, where I've had photo bleaching from the uh, projector there. The retinal, all of the retinal in those uh, rods and cones where... Uh, that has fallen on the back of my retina has had all of uh, the retina bleached off. All right, um, that is temporary. It takes a little bit of time to uh, replace all of that. Night blindness is simply a vitamin A deficiency. You don't have, you're not getting enough vitamin A. So here's vitamin A retinol. Uh, it gets converted to retinal. Uh, you see here by the, uh, by the uh, oxidation of this carbon uh, from an alcohol to an aldehyde, which is why we call it al, written all alcohol uh, gets oxidized to an aldehyde. Uh, beta carotene, we just hydrolyze uh, this central double bond in beta carotene, and for every molecule of beta carotene, we're going to get two uh, retinols out. All right, so carrots are a, a lovely thing to do to your eyes. The dual vision system, man, that quiz business at the beginning of class threw my timing off here today. Um, so there's scotopic and the photopic. The scotopic or low light vision is very sensitive. Uh, it's able to pick up small amounts of light. So this is for when you're in the dark. The photopic system is for bright light, when there's lots of light, but when you need high resolution, high uh, discrimination. So and let's look at and see what happens here. There, there's this notion of uh, vertical convergence where we have a lot of photoreceptors uh, synapsing on... A, still a lot of bipolar, but much fewer bipolar cells who are all converging on a single ganglion cell. These ganglion cells uh, are called M or Magno, a ganglion M cell, a Magno. It's a, it's a unique ganglion cell, a ganglion cell unique to the rods. So we have a lot of convergence here. All right, you see that? 
Uh, in the photopic system, on the other hand, so for example, this could be a, a, a square millimeter of the retina is being controlled by a single uh, magno cell, a single ganglion cell. So that a photon anywhere in this area is going to set off the signal here. All right? So very sensitive. Whereas in the photopic system, uh, we have really high resolution. All right? If we're going to set off this ganglion cell, it's got to hit right here on this single cone. It can't hit any of these other ones for this ganglion cell to go off. Not very sensitive. But highly spatially resolved. So this, a single ganglion cell monitors a square millimeter of retina versus a, two micrometers of retina in these parvo. P, parvo means small in these ganglion P cells. All right? This is giving us uh, edge resolution, fine detail, color, Whereas here, we're getting uh, motion, the general form of an object, motion, and uh, shadowing that comes in dim light. This is the dual vision system that we have. You can't get both. You can't have high sensitivity and uh, high resolution. Uh, okay, so retinal convergence. I've talked about the visual system is massively complex and requires a tremendous amount of central processing. That processing starts right at the first synapse, before you even get to the brain, right in the retina. It happens right in the retina. Um, so, for example, in retinal convergence, uh, you can have 130 million photoreceptors in that square millimeter of the rods, uh, synapse on 6 million bipolar cells, that only uh, synapse on a single million ganglion cells. All right, so there's a lot of processing that's already happening uh, as, we're getting, as we're getting this convergent processing. There's also horizontal integration, however, that's being mediated at each of these points by the horizontal cells and the amacrine cells. So for example, <clears throat> if I were to tell you you're all mapped out in the classroom here, and I was going to make a picture. You've seen people at, at, at uh, football games or whatever. They, they hold up the cards that are different colors, and they make a map of a flag or something. We could do the same thing. I could give you each a color. I could tell you, you know, this is your color. You're, you're red. You're white. You're purple. Something like that. Uh, and you'd have to guess what the picture is. But... You have to all the only information you have is the color that I assigned you. Unless I enabled you to talk to all your nearest neighbors. So then you would know what color you are and the colors around you. So you would know whether you were in the middle of a patch of red or whether you are on the edge of a patch of red. Okay? That's the kind of processing that's happening with these horizontal cells and these amacrine cells. Okay, so this horizontal uh, signal processing. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into this concept. I, I don't want to. I'm running out of time. Um, so the signal comes out of the eye through these ganglionic cells through the optic nerve. Whoops. Uh, and travels back along the optic tract, the optic chiasm where we trade fibers. Uh, we get some uh, synapsing in the lateral, lateral geniculate, which I don't think you need to know, but, um, and then we also have radiations to the superior colliculus. Eventually, all of these projection fibers travel back to uh, the optic uh, or visual cortex. Okay, and it all goes back to the visual cortex, which is presumably where this internal image that we experience is being represented. There's a lot of mist. I just this is like that cartoon, you know, all the all the mathematics, and then there's like the miracle happens, and then the answer, right? This is kind of it. 
uh, how that image is, act, what that image is and where it's being uh, represented in the back of the head is still pretty mysterious. Uh, cone types and sensitivity to color. So uh, the rods have a broad spectrum sensitivity right here in the black. Uh, the cones, there are three different types of cones uh, who, which di differ only in the rhodopsin and the specific wavelengths of light that they have as their peaks. We have a blue, green, and a red uh, that have different peaks along the color spectrum. Um, and that adds up to white. These are not the only three rhodopsin molecules that are out there. For example, a, a, a crow has five different uh, types of rhodopsin, and theirs extends well beyond what we consider to be the visual spectrum. For a crow, the visual spectrum ends like way over here somewhere. So when a crow sees another crow, we see a crow looking black, but a crow sees a crow looking kind of like a parrot, like they have patterns on them and they have, uh, and they're brightly colored to each other. But they can see in a part of the spectrum that we cannot see in. All right, so that's kind of interesting. To me, I guess. Uh, is there anyone colorblind in the class? Does anyone can't see? What number is that? Does anyone can't see a 12 there? So you can test for color blindness with these Ishihara tests. They're pretty fun. Um, a person who ha has normal vision is going to see, uh, you know, the, the, the rainbow flag right here. Uh, protonopia, who has no red cones, this is what they would see when they were looking at this. Uh, deuteranopia, with no uh, green cones, would look like this. And tritinopia, no blue cones, would look like that. If you had no cones at all and you were completely colorblind, you would see nothing but gray dots when you looked at that. All right. So does anybody not see? Oh, wow. Yeah, well, this projector sucks. But uh, does anybody not see 6, 42, and 25 there? Forget that. Never mind. This projector is horrible. <laughs> yeah. I Never mind. It was like, my whole class is colorblind. <laughs> All right, the ear. Yes? Um, if, like, you tell the crow, if you have, if you can see through all the spectrum, like, what's your way to determine what you're seeing on the cone? Yeah, I mean, it's returning, all of those cones are returning information. Uh... So, for example, say you have light that's this color right here, right? You're going li to be lighting up all three of these, all three of those cones, right? But the relative distribution of them is going to help your brain determine that it is some kind of teal color. Whereas if it's over here, it's quite clearly going to be red here. Uh, if you light up these, to, but none of these, the ra no ratio of these, then we know it's some kind of yellow color, etc. Okay? Um, I don't want to, we're not going to go over the anatomy of the ear. I just want to, I'm running out of time here. Um, the external ear, the only thing about the external ear is uh, earwax. If you've got earwax, the way to get rid of earwax is to not stick a q tip in your ear. Uh, you can damage your ear. It's not actually good for yourself to put Q-tips in there. The best thing is to actually just put a little bit of mineral oil in your ear. Um, here's the eardrum. The eardrum, like the optic nerve, can tell you about a lot of pathology by looking at uh, the eardrum with an otoscope. You can have acute infection, fluid, perforated eardrum. There's a hole. Uh, here's an ear tube for a person who has got a problem with their eustachian tube. Um, yeah, don't do that. Ooh. Um... So uh, otitis media is a middle ear infection. It happens a lot in some kids because uh, the, the cranial morphology of them has not developed uh, into the adult yet. And because of that, they, they don't get good drainage from that middle ear. And that these people tend to be prone to middle ear infections. You can just stick a little tube up there in the eustachian tube to keep it open to help the drainage. What a beautiful picture. Here's a light 
that somebody stuck in the ear and then they stuck a camera up the Eustachian tube and took a picture of the middle ear of this person. Uh, here's the stapes, here's the stapedius muscle. Uh, this is what's dampening the vibrations at the oval window. Um, okay, hearing. Let's talk, let's, I'll get through as much of this as I can. Um, so this is just the anatomy. I'm not going to go through the anatomy again. Um, again, more anatomy. Anatomy. Uh, here's a scanning electron micrograph of the cochlear hair cells. So these would be uh, outer hair cells, and these are inner hair cells. The tectorial membrane would be laying on top of this. It's been removed so that we can see the, eye, uh, the hair cells. Uh, this is what healthy hair cells look like if you are smart and protect your ears. And uh, you can be cool. This guy's super cool looking, but uh, he's, he's going he's gonna to have a lot of gear in his ear when he gets late, late in life uh, because he's to, this, this noise damages the hair cells and, and, and kills, kills off those uh, those hair cells. So how does it work? Uh, sound requires air. Um, and, you know, something vibrates and compresses the air waves. So there's these waves of compression that uh, converge on the tympanic membrane, right? And these waves have certain wavelengths, right? So this is the frequency, the wavelength is just the inverse of the frequency, and the amplitude of these waves is a measure of the actual energy. So how um, loud is that sound? Is it, is it quiet or is it really loud? Um, the cochlea. So this is, this is step by step. Step one, sound wave arrives, vibrates this membrane, and uh, that... that um, that vibration gets uh, transmitted. Let's just get through all of those. Uh, gets transmitted through the auditory ossicles uh, to the oval window. This oval window vibrates, uh, causing a a vibration in the perilymph, which is then translated through uh, the basilar membrane. Uh, and causes a stimulation of the hair cells at the, uh, in the basilar membrane in the organ of Corti, and that uh, fluid pressure just comes and is released at the, at the round window. So I talked about uh, how one goes in, the other goes out to kind of stabilize the pressure. But that vibration, you, you set up a sympathetic pattern in uh, the me basilar membrane that stimulates those hair cells and leads uh, to the, the, um, the signal that gets sent to the brain. So uh, here's a little bit more schematized image. Uh, we have, it, it presses in here, the stapy moves inwards, and it pushes the basilar membrane down, uh, and then uh, it moves outward, and the basilar membrane moves up, and uh, the, the the round and oval windows move accordingly. The thing is, there's this labeled line code with all of the neurons from the hair cells along the length of this cochlea. So the cochlea here, we're showing it as a tube. We've just taken that spiral and spun it out into a long tube, okay? So if we're going to shake the membrane down here, we, we, uh, we interpret this as a 16,000 hertz vibration. Very short wavelength. Very high frequency. Didn't have to travel very far to stimulate the basilar membrane. Uh, over here, it's only 1,000 hertz, 1,000 beats per second. So if we, if we shake the membrane here, this is a much longer uh, wavelength to get that to happen, a much lower frequency. Okay. So when we're actually shaking the membrane there and stimulating these hair cells, what's actually happening? Uh, we have these hairs on the top of, of these uh, audio, 
receptors, uh, these neuroreceptors, sensory receptors, they're, they're connected, uh, one hair is connected to the, the next by virtue of these uh, links. When the hair cells tip to the side, these uh, links yank open the door. This is a mechanically gated channel and allow uh, potassium to flood into the cell. All right. Then all of this is mapped onto the uh, auditory cortex. So we have the signal that comes in uh, from the cochlear branch along the, the cochlear nerve to the vestibular cochlear nerve. We get uh, a signaling in this cochlear nucleus which ascends to uh, the inferior uh, colliculus. So uh, this is the pineal gland. These four are the uh, corpora quadrigemina. We talked about the, the relay that happens in the superior colliculus for the eyes, and then the inferior colliculus for the ears. The four of them is the corpora quadrigemina, the body of four twins. Okay. And then from there, uh, we have a synapse in the thalamus. Uh, remember, for anything to reach your consciousness, for you to be aware of it, we got to have a synapse in the, in the thalamus, which then projects into the temporal lobe, and you have this uh, somatotopic mapping or audiotopic mapping where uh, there is each frequency is laid out in the auditory cortex. Um, so if you were able to, like in high resolution, map out the stimulation in an auditory cortex, you could literally see the vocal patterns, the frequency patterns of any kind of sound that you may be listening to. Um, all right. So ears, I, I like to wax poetic about eyes, but ears are incredible. There is really no equipment that humans have ever dreamed up and built or found elsewhere in anything but hearing that is as unique as hearing. There is, so the ability for the ears to hear quiet sounds and to not explode when they hear really intense uh, stimulation is phenomenal. There's no other sensory uh, system that you have that can have, so this is a log scale. This is a log scale, the decibel level Decibels are uh, a log scale. This is a trillion-fold power range. Imagine the lightest touch that you can perceive, the very lightest touch, but then make that a trillion times more intense. I don't think so. Okay, the lightest, the, 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 the smallest light you can see, a single photon. If you were to expose your eyes to a trillion photons, uh, all in, in, in a focused place on the eye, you would be burning a hole in the back of your head. Uh, the fact that your ears have this amazing uh, dynamic range of, of the power, uh, of a power range is, is phenomenal. It's, it's truly phenomenal. But you have to be careful, though. So, you know, you can go and listen to a rocket on a launch pad, but don't plan on having your, your sweetheart whisper in your ear afterwards because your ears are going to be done at that point. Um, so even here, uh, if you have consistent uh, exposure to busy traffic, you're going to get some damage to your ears if you're always listening to busy traffic or working in a noisy restaurant. Um, subway, heavy traffic, chainsaw. If you listen to a chainsaw for more than two hours straight, you're going to be, uh, you, can, you can plan on some, some sound, uh, some damage to your ears. Uh, people actually, modern society is not very good to their, to their ears. But the best thing about this one is heavy metal rock concert, immediate danger. <laughs> All right. Um, 
the bony labyrinth. So now I want to talk about the vestibular system in the last, like, 10 minutes of class here, 8 minutes of class. It's based upon, there's the, there's the, the semicircular ducts and uh, the utricle and the macule, uh, uh, the saccule, the utricle and the saccule, pardon me. Um, but it's all based upon these hair cells, which are quite analogous to the hair cells found in the cochlea. Here's a scanning electron micrograph, a colorized micrograph of uh, a hair cell stack uh, that you might find um, in one of the ampulla. What, what, what point was I making? Provide information about direction and strength of mechanical stimuli. So here's the crista ampullaris. I think I showed this, or something like this picture in lab at least. Um, here we have, so it's going to be a semicircular canal right here. And we're going to move our body within the plane of that canal. And the fluid is going to move in that canal. It's going to bend this cupula. Remember, this thing is the cupula. Uh, with these hair cells embedded in it. And when that happens, those potassium channels on the top of the cells uh, with, the, with the tip links are going to uh, open up and allow calcium to flood in and send a signal to um, the brain. So... These hairs on the hair cell in the semicircular ducts, there's two types. There's the stereocilia, and then there's this kinocilium, the kinocilium. Kinocilium is sort of the reference, uh, the reference point for these other stereocilia. If you bend stereocilia towards the kinocilium, the cell will depolarize, and the sensory nerve, uh, neuron turns on. If it bends in the opposite direction, it's going to turn the sensory neuron off and in inhibit it. So not only do we get information about whether uh, we're, we're moving in that plane, but we get information about which direction we're moving in that plane. So if you have hair cells with a kinocilium pointing this way next to a kino, uh, hair cells with a kinocilium pointing in the other way, you're going to be able to know not only that you're moving, for example, in the XY plane or something, but which direction in the XY plane you're moving. Does that make sense? <clears throat> All right. So that's the, the semicircular canals. Um, and this is giving you uh, information about acceleration within three-dimensional space. Um, the saccule and the utricle are uh, structures for understanding what uh, direction you're pointing, just base orientation. So the way this works is uh, you have these two structures in the uh, vestibule, uh, the utricle and the saccule, in those areas, there's this thing called the macula. And a macula is just a space where we have a density of hair cells. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of hair cells with, with this gelatinous material stuck on top of it. And then on top of that is the otolith, this otolith. These are uh, made up of staticonia, uh, which are little crystals of calcium carbonate. My wife's grandmother uh, is this woman who lives, she comes from farmland in Wisconsin. And she makes this kind of repulsive stuff called 7-Up Salad. It is uh, in, in the Midwest, and are there any Midwesterners in, in the room? Well, I, I'm a Midwesterner. And... Uh, they like Jello salad, at least where she's from. I'm from Detroit. They, we didn't eat a lot of Jello there, but um, in Wisconsin, they make this this Jello, 
and it's made with, uh, I don't know, lime jello with 7-Up and a bunch of, you know, gross things in it. And then on top of it, she would layer bananas and, um, and shredded cheese on top of it. And the thing that I remember, the reason I'm telling you this story about this disgusting salad um, is that when I, I remember watching her walk into, into the kitchen of my mother-in-law's house, carrying this thing, expecting us to eat it, and she was carrying it, and this jello was going like this, right? It was just rocking and rolling because she couldn't really keep it steady. And it had all of this mass of bananas and, and shredded cheese and marshmallow whip and stuff like that gooed on top of this, this stack of, of jello. And it reminds me of, of this a little bit here. Uh, and th this is why we have the staticonia and this otolith, because it helps give some mass to this gelatinous material so it can vibrate uh, and, or slide in one direction or the other direction and stimulate these hair cells. So let me get a picture going here. We have this gentleman uh, who is standing upright and, and gravity is keeping the staticonia in one place or this otolith in one place. He tilts his head back and it slides down. The jelly kind of slides with the, the marshmallows and cheese and, and bananas. Uh, slides back this way and sets off those, uh, sets off those hair cells. Okay, that's the macula. Um, and then this is just the projection pathways. Uh, when any of the stuff from the vestibular system stimulates uh, uh, the nerve, the, the nerve comes back, goes through all these pathways uh, through the vestibular nuclei and the pons, uh, which then uh, sends radiations out to the cerebellum. Uh, we get uh, projections into the geniculate nucleus or the oculomotor, I'm sorry, oculomotor nuclei. Um, and then for it to reach our awareness, again, we have to have a uh, synapse in the thalamus, uh, which then goes up to the vestibular cortex, uh, which helps us with our orientation and our balance. All right, so this is my last slide, I think. Uh, this is the pathology called nystagmus. Um, there, nystagmus, it, there is normal nystagmus, which is if you are in uh, a train, I'm sure most of you have ridden on a train or a subway or a bus or a car, um, and as you go by, you're watching the telephone poles zip by you, your eyes are kind of doing this thing, you like follow the telephone pole, then you jerk forward to the next. That's a kind of normal uh, nystagmus, but nystagmus can be uh, pathologic, and there's a lot of different types of nystagmus that we're not going to obviously have a chance to go through all of them uh, that can report on a whole host of different problems, uh, neuro neurological problems. But and so it's it's worthwhile spending some time to know what each of these types of nystagmus are because they can really help you quickly identify uh, the problem when somebody comes in to, to the clinic. The one I wanted to, to uh, point out here was this vestibular nystagmus. So it's a horizontal or rotary movement of the eyes that suggests vestibular disease or cochlear uh, dysfunction. So it's, it's the, the eyes go like this or maybe a little bit like, like this in, in unison. This is a vestibular uh, type of uh, nystagmus. I, I remember I had, uh, I, when I was at Notre Dame, I used to uh, tutor this blind girl in, in a bunch of classes, and she had a type of nystagmus. Uh, she was totally blind, but her eyes would, would do this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, nystagmus jerking. This was uh, not vestibular. I, I, it's, is that one was it? I guess it was pendular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she had pendular nystagmus. It's congenital loss of, of vision. 
All right, uh, the, the recap. I went over ocular anatomy, the optics of the eye. I talked in detail about photoreception. And then I kind of glossed over the oral anatomy. You got that. Talked about cochlear function, hearing, and the projection pathways for both hearing and the vestibular cochlear system. Any questions?